Welcome to the current federal tax developments for the week of September the 30th, 2019. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. This week we're going to take a look at a few things. Number one, we have the section 199 cap a safe harbor for rental real estate properties that was released in final form by the IRS this week. We'll talk about what they changed. We'll talk about the way the safe harbor works and also discuss whether it's really terribly useful or not. We'll also have a discussion of the IRS releasing the special per diem rates. Uh, these take effect on October the 1st of 2019. So the IRS brought them out here just before they come into play. We'll talk about what the rates are for the years for the year coming up here from October 1st of 19 to September 30 of 2020, as well as you know how they work how they work with this system, the high low rates, maybe some of the things that have changed. And finally, we'll take a look at a taxpayer who tried to argue he had reasonable cause for not filing his return based on the fact that he was imprisoned and the fact that because of that imprisonment, he couldn't get access to records that might have enabled him to claim some deductions against his income and that he should therefore be excused from the failure to file and the late payment penalty. Tax court wasn't so thrilled with that view. Well, like always, we're coming back up here on another week. And I want to remind you that we do have coming up on the 16th uh, for many state societies uh, being broadcast by Cal CPA, the special partnership, advanced to partnership issues course featuring the new partnership audit rules. It's going to run, you can check your state society website on that date for this course. It's running depending upon where you're at. Your state society may have one one, the other, or both of these times for start. We're going to have this starting at 6 a.m. on 6 a.m. Pacific time, I should say, and also then one that starts at 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, obviously, you adjust that for your time zone, so that's 9 a.m. Eastern, or it starts at 11 a.m. Eastern, and of course, otherwise, you adjust as you can. This course will talk about the partnership audit regime, how that worked, and you can sign up for it. Again, it'll be October the 16th. Cal CPA is running it. And again, it's going to be picked up by a number of state societies. You can run it and watch the course that was taped. Uh, I did the session in Albuquerque a little while back. So we're going to be running it on the 16th. So if you have interest, sign up for that. Let's talk about our first development for this week. This is Revenue Procedure 2019-38. Many of you may remember back in January when the final regulations came out with regard to Section 199 Cap A, the IRS released at the same time a draft revenue procedure that was to allow people to be able to treat their rental properties as a trader business by meeting a safe harbor. Now, we were allowed to use this for 2018 returns, but it was clearly labeled in the notice, notice 2019-07, as a draft revenue procedure. Well, Revenue Procedure 2019-38 is now that final version of the procedure. And in fact, there weren't a whole lot of changes made. If you've been working with that procedure, the big things that changed was, number one, they did add a rule to deal with mixed-use property. We'll discuss briefly how that works, but mixed-use property is that sort of property where I own a building, and on the ground floor, there is commercial property. On the floors above, there is residential. You know, we have these all throughout here in the Phoenix area in various places. You'll find them lots of times in downtown areas or close to midtown areas uh, is where we tend to find these structures, but they're there. You'll see them in the suburbs too. Similarly, in those sort of middle of town areas for the suburbs or around certain things that are just considered of interest. So we have these kinds of structures. And the problem was that under the original uh, revenue procedure, we had an issue that you could either have commercial properties in an enterprise or you could have residential properties in an enterprise. So these combined use buildings didn't appear to fit. We'll now discover we can make them fit. We got a little bit, not a whole lot, but a little bit of a break on the documentation that will have to be kept for the hours that are involved for people who are working on your rentals to meet the 250 hour test. And they did push back contemporaneous documentation rule has been pushed back so that you don't have to have contemporaneous documentation until 2020 until 2020, I should say. Uh, that was originally supposed to be required for this year. 
I think part of the pushback came because it did come after the beginning of the year. So taxpayers didn't know and it took some time to get the word out. So likely they weren't aware they needed the documentation until they were partially through this year. Obviously they couldn't get that afterwards. So the final regulations do make changes and push that back for one more year. But they do warn us that uh, don't, don't overplay your hand here. Uh, what we have in this case is we can do these regulations, we can do this. You don't have to have this perfect contemporaneous documentation, but they warn you you've got to have something. You know, you can't, it's not a free pass saying everybody gets 250 this year because we didn't require contemporaneous documentation. They're saying, no, you better be able to have some proof to back this up if you make the election. Now, you might wonder, you know, some of you, hey, guess what? We've got about two weeks to go before the final filing deadline for rental properties. You know, I should say for individuals. And you might think, well, does that mean I have to go ahead now and use this new system for the returns I haven't filed yet? Do I have to amend the old returns to come into play for this revenue procedure? And the IRS tells us in this no. You actually have your choice here. You can either use the old or the new version. Now, for practical purposes, a lot of returns have been filed that have rentals. You know, they didn't wait to the last two weeks of the extended filing deadline to get the returns finished. Uh, you know, a lot of people have already filed those. You would have to look at amending if somehow this made a difference for you and you wanted to use the 2019 version. The most likely reason why you'd want to use the later version, the final version of it from RepProc 2019-38 would be if you had an issue with mixed-use property and you wanted to make this election. Otherwise, not really sure why you'd want the 19 version over the 18 version, because a lot of the differences here are minor. Some of them are, in fact, there's a larger exclusion as to what doesn't count. So as a practical matter, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of reason to go for this procedure over the original one. I can argue that for many of us, there's not much reason to go for either of them over you know either of these procedures we, we can argue back and forth about whether in fact these are very useful unless you're in the second circuit and you know if you're not in the second circuit court of appeals and your appeals aren't going there i'm not so sure this is the greatest thing anyway but you know what, whatever, whatever goes for you, if you like it fine go for it so we'll be talking about how that works now basic issue we still have the tests that are involved before we do still have the rule that we divide our rentals up into enterprises now an enterprise can be you can have every rental be its own enterprise you can combine like properties for this purpose like is considered commercial is one type of property residential are another if you are going to combine enterprises it's an all-or-nothing routine you can't say I'm going to combine these six commercial buildings, but I'm going to leave these three out unless they're excluded. You can't leave those three out. You, know, you have to pick up all of them. It's all or nothing. It's also very clear that once you do that, you have to do it consistently. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but basically once you're in, you're in. Now, one of the key things they said, though, is they did come up with this uh, safe harbor, I should say, for the mixed use properties. Because of our commercial properties with mixed-use property, the final revenue procedure states that you, an interest in a mixed-use property may be treated as a single rental real estate enterprise or may be bifurcated into separate residential commercial enterprises. For purposes of the procedure, mixed-use property is defined as a single building that combines residential and commercial units. An interest in such mixed-use property, if it's treated as a single rental enterprise, may not be treated as part of the same enterprise as other residential, commercial, or mixed-use property. So one of the key takeaways from this is if you have mixed-use property, you have to treat them each as separate enterprises. So I've got to meet the 250 on that building standalone. Even if I have 10 properties, all of which are mixed-use, I cannot combine those 10, right? I cannot elect to combine those particular ones. If I want to combine, I have to bifurcate them and then put them into the commercial group and the residential group. But I cannot do it this way by trying to combine the mixed use on their own, right? We do that in this case, we have a special case for mixed use. Did tell you about the fact that, yes, to remind you, those of you who may be watching on the video, that consistency is required. 
if I don't elect combine things this year as a single enterprise, so I treat each rental as a single enterprise, or I just don't make the elect, I just don't even make the, you know, the election under Safe Harbor, then I could come back maybe in two, three years, and I can decide later to treat all of the commercials and all of the residentials as a single enterprise. Now, if I've made that election, though, in the future, every time I get a new rental, I've got to put it into its proper grouping. And I have to keep reporting that way. So, essentially, this is a one-way ticket. You, If you don't make the election, you always can make it later. But once you made the election, you can't get out of it without, essentially, well, basically, you just simply can't, for the revenue procedure, get out. You'll be stuck with it. Now, of course, if you don't qualify, that leaves a few things open about how this goes. We have the same basic three tests to meet. So if you remember from the original revenue procedure, some things you have to have. There is a little bit of clarification here, so it's somewhat useful. We have to have separate books and records maintained to reflect income and expenses for each enterprise. However, now the revenue procedure clarifies something I think is going to help a lot of people. It says, you know, a, if a real estate enterprise contains more than one property, you satisfy this books and records requirement, no problem. As if you have statements for each property is maintained and then consolidated, that's considered to be fine and meets the books and records. If you read the original revenue procedure literally, some people may have been concerned that, well, if, if, all I ha if I have a ledger for every single rental, but I don't have a ledger for commercial somewhere, uh, I, I'm, you know, people are concerned they couldn't add up those and treat them as if they had books and records for the whole enterprise. IRS is saying, yeah, you, you can do that. If you have detailed ledgers on your 12 residential properties, you can still treat all 12 as a single enterprise. You simply consolidate those 12 uh, ledgers together, consolidate basically the results, come up with an overall result, and you're fine. Again, the 250 hour rule is in place here. So you have to have 250 more hours of service performed per year. Uh, if they've been in existence for at least four years, then you look at any three of the five years uh, that ended with the taxable year to see if you have that. So you don't need to have 250 this year. If you can show me you had 250 in three prior years of the last five, or in essence, in any three of the, or let's say three of, three of the five years, I should say, so if we can meet that, that's fine. Otherwise, we meet it for the years in question until we get to number three. And the documentation rules are a bit less of a problem. The documentation, contemporary documentation, which will not take effect now until 2020. What you have to maintain is hours of services performed through reports, logs, or similar documents, a description of the services performed, the dates on which they were performed, and who performed the services. If these reg expenses, you know, these basically these activities are performed by employers or contractors, you can provide a description of the rental services performed by such employer or independent contractor, the amount of time the employer or contractor generally spends performing such services for the enterprise, and time, wage, or payment records basically for that contractor. You have to have these available for inspection. Okay, so that's basically the issue. Uh, like I said, you do still have to attach an election. So you have your election saying we're going to keep, you know, we're going to make this election. It is an election you make. You're not required to elect. You can. If you attach the statement, it has to have a description of all the properties that are included in your election, a description including addresses, you know, of anything acquired or disposed of during the year, and a representation of the requirements of the procedure have been satisfied. Now, rental services, we have a list of what's included. In essence, they said it includes these things, but it's not limited to them. So advertising to rent or lease the real estate will count. So will negotiating and executing leases, verifying information contained in prospective tenant applications, collecting the rent, daily operation, maintenance, and repair of the property, including the purchase of materials and supplies for the property, managing the real estate, and supervision of the employees and independent contractors. However, what will not count is arranging financing or procuring property, studying and reviewing the financial statements or reports on operations, improving the property, so anything that gets capitalized under regulation 1.263 little a dash 3d, and any hours spent traveling to and from the real estate. 
as we discussed back when this first came out, that travel exception is interesting because that travel does count for material participation purposes, but it won't count for this purpose. So, you know, if you're a real estate pro, we can count those hours for material participation of the property, but they will not count for this being under the safe harbor rules, counting as real estate, as essentially trader business real estate. Not sure why the service doesn't like the traveling, but they don't. Okay. We also cannot include the following four categories of real estate in our enterprise. Any real estate used by the taxpayer, including owner or beneficiary of a pass-through entity as a residence under 280 cap A, D. Uh, real estate rented or leased under a triple net lease. The definition of a triple net lease uh, is a lease agreement that requires a tenant or lessee to pay the taxes, fees, and insurance and pay for maintenance activities for a property in addition to rent and utilities. Third category we can include is real, real estate lease rented to a trade or business owned by a taxpayer or a pass-through entity, which is commonly controlled. And finally, we cannot uh, include them in this enterprise uh, if any portion is treated as a specified service trade or business. So the anti crack and pack. The big ads there were the last two. The first one, because you may think, wait, wait a minute, right? If we're leasing to a pass-through enterprise, right? That is a trader business. We have common control. Then that's automatically a trader business. And the IRS is saying, yeah, but we don't want you then, maybe you've got tons of hours in that. We don't want you then accumulating that with something else. That gets kept out. It's a trader business or not. If it's a C corporation, so it wouldn't qualify under that unless it qualified separately. We're not going to let you aggregate it with other properties that aren't being leased to a related party or a thing under common control. And the specified service trader business rule, which, yeah, kind of in many ways, yeah, if it wasn't, it, it, this one's kind of weird because the third category probably takes this one in the most part. But if somehow you have a crack and pack situation where it's some or partially treated as a specified service trader business because it's rented to a entity that is a specified service trader business under the effective common control rules. Yeah, you're, you're not allowed to at, put that in the mix either. And again, the theory here being that it would be one of those issues where we could get extra hours built in. And again, they don't want you building up the hours under that structure. Now, the real question we've got with this whole revenue procedure and I've had since it first came out is, does it really matter? That is, because remember, the question here, all this proves to us is our rental is a trader business. And trader business can qualify for 199 Cap A. And in reality, there's a couple of things to worry about here. First thing is, it may not be a good thing for the rental to qualify for Cap A. And I'm talking about a lot of rentals. This will be a problem. If your client's rental properties have carryover passive losses, this could be a major problem. So every year you operate the rental, it's losing money on paper. I know cash flow wise is positive, but with depreciation and everything, we're losing money on paper. If this is a specified, if this is a trader business, that negative number, when we finally get it deducted, is going to reduce QBI. Now, as you may recall, when we sell the rental property, we're going to say that's a 1231 gain. We're presuming we get a gain. And we'll treat that as 1231 gains. Well, that's where you make the money off this rental that somebody bought. You know, they bought it five years ago. They lease it for five years and they go sell it. They make money off, of the, off the appreciation. Well, here's our problem. That 1231 gain will not count for 199 cap A income because assuming that it's taxes capital gain, won't be in there. But we're still going to have to take this negative. And even though, you know, you don't have to do a negative QBI uh, to add back, you do have to take that negative and either apply it against your positive QBI numbers for the year, so it's going to reduce your deduction, or if you have no QBI this year, that thing's going to carry over waiting till you someday get QBI. So rental's not necessarily positive if it becomes a trader business. But here's the catch. Even if it is positive, the reality is that the case law makes it very clear that normally a rental will probably be a trader business. You go back to the 1943 case of Fackler versus Commissioner, 133 F.2nd, 
509, which is a taxpayer had a single commercial property that was considered to be a trade or business. Uh, the tax court 1946 case of Hazard versus Commissioner 7 TC 372. That was a taxpayer with a single family residence. In both cases, the court found even though there was a single activity and the taxpayer didn't do a whole lot, it was still a trade or business because they had enough contact with it. Now, the one exception to this is found in the Second Circuit where we have the Greer case. Greer suggests that, yeah, the Second Circuit wasn't so sure about this single rental qualifying as a trade or business. So Greer has some issues. Now, we don't know how far Greer goes and how much more work you could do to make clear it in the Second Circuit, but there probably is some concern in the Second Circuit, and I think the safe harbor may make people feel better there. Outside the Second Circuit, being a trader business simply hasn't really been difficult for this. And as I said, because a trader business of a rental may be a negative, the IRS issues an interesting statement. They, they tell you that if you don't meet the safe harbor, that does not mean that you're not a trader business and that you could not take that position. And then it says, and also doesn't mean the IRS can't argue that position on exam. And I think in a lot of cases, when people think this through, they're going to see that in most cases, they've got more of a problem this being a 199 cap A activity than an advantage. And now the problem is going to be that, yeah, this doesn't, this is not the be all and end all for when a rental is a trader business. And I expect a lot of taxpayers you're going to find the IRS saying their rentals are trader business and coming after them to reduce their QBI deduction elsewhere. Next, we have a, we have an IRS ruling here, a little simpler. Notice 2019-55 issued on September the 25th. This is the IRS notice of the special per diem rates. There are three special rates that are out here. There's a transportation industry meal and incidental expense rates. There's a rate for incidental expenses only deduction for people that only reimburse that. And then there's the rates and list of high cost localities for the high low substantiation method. Well, the first of these is the special transportation rate. And this is pretty much, as I recall, staying the same as as before. Uh, the special transportation rate uh, for any locality of travel in the continental United States is $66 for any somebody in the transportation industry and it's 71 for locality outside the continental US. That's going to be your basic structure with, with this, you know, that that's your meal incidental expense for the transportation industry. We also have the incidental only uh, deduction. You can decide to tell your employees to account for their hotel bill, right? Account for their meals. But then you can say, yeah, all those incidental things you have to pick up, minor details when you're on the road, little bits of tips, you know, maybe you're picking up, you need to pick up a piece of, you, know, you need to maybe pick up a pin or something, or maybe, oh, you forgot to bring toothpaste, so you buy toothpaste. All those little incidentals, that's $5 per day. So if you just want to do incidentals for reimbursement, you can do five bucks a day. Personally, I think that's such a small number, it's almost insulting uh, that, you know, to do that one. But if you do it, five bucks is your number. And finally, we have the standard high-low rate. Now, the, the, this is, if you remember, this is a method the IRS actually tried to get rid of a few years ago, saying nobody should need this anymore, right? We made it so simple to go online and get the actual rate for every city. You know, uh, we say GSA has an app. Actually, the app they just uh, recently upgraded uh, that actually now can create a PDF report for that day. It will also tell you each meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if you want to reimburse that way. I mean, you know, it's got all kinds of neat things, but apparently a whole lot of people just like the only two numbers. So we still, we now have the two number method. This changes October 1st. Uh, high rate cities, th this will be for doing everything, would be $297 a day. For other cities, it's 200 if you're just doing meals and incidentals, which a lot of people do, because you know the theory is it's not that tough to count for the hotel. Uh, so we'll do the meals and incidentals. In fact, the interesting part is when I travel and get reimbursed for this, uh, we actually have to submit the uh, hotel bill, even if we're not paying it. 
you know, no, nobody's, you know, in essence, being picked up by our customer because that, that's how they prove we were in the city for meals and incidentals. So it's like, yeah, you know, we're all, we would always be reporting. So no, they're not going to just say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to give you this $297 and you go find, you know, whatever cheap hotel you want to, to pocket the difference. Cause we realize that's, you know, employees, employees tend to not, not live as high on the town uh, when they're on the per diem, they like to pocket the difference. So the, you know, per day, $71 in a high cost city for incident, meals and incidentals, $60 per day for other cities. Again, don't forget incidentals only is five bucks. Same thing here for any way you're doing it. We've got that. The IRS does publish in here in section 5.2 of notice 201955. You have the full list of high cost cities and what, what type high cost localities I should say and what time of the year, you know, they're counted as high cost if it's not the entire year. They also give us a list of cities this year that were added. Uh, new cities this year added to high cost were Mill Valley, San Rafael, and Novato, California, Crested Butte and Gunnison, Colorado, Petoskey, Michigan, Big Sky, West Yellowstone, Gardner, Montana, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Nashville, Tennessee, and Midland and Odessa, Texas. Uh, they modify the time of year that the following entities, the following localities will be considered high cost. So they'll be high cost for part of the year. It's just a different cutoff begin and end date than it was. Napa, California, Santa Barbara, California, Denver, Colorado, and Vail, Colorado, Washington, D.C., uh, Key West, Florida, Jekyll Island, Brunswick, Georgia, New York City, uh, Portland, Oregon, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Pecos, Texas, Vancouver, Washington, and Jackson, Pine Deal, Wyoming. And finally, the following localities went off the high cost list for this year, so they will be considered to be regular cost localities. That includes Los Angeles and San Diego, uh, Duluth, Minnesota, Mo Moab, Utah, and Virginia Beach, Virginia have gone off the list. So if you're using high-low rates, there's your changes. Final issue this week is a case, and that this case is the case of George versus Commissioner, Task Court Random Decision 2019-128. And Mr. George is an ex-NBA player, right? Uh, who was jailed uh, for essentially wire fraud and a Ponzi scheme. So, you know, he had a few things to do. He had to find a new way to make money after his career ended. So he found this, apparently. Turns out people aren't really thrilled about that. So you've got this wire fraud for running a real estate Ponzi scheme. And he hadn't actually filed his tax returns. That was kind of his problem here. Failed to file a return for the years in question. During those years, he received a fairly decent sized pension from the NBA. $208,111 were paid to him during the year. The NBA did withhold on that, but he didn't file a return and obviously the withholding is not going to be sufficient to cover the tax due on his return because he was under age 59 and a half. So the additional 10% you know, early distribution payment was going to be due on this. And of course it wasn't covered. So we had an issue there. So his overall deficiency for that year was just over seventy thousand dollars. Now he doesn't dispute that he owes the seventy grand, but he did argue about the penalties for late filing and late payment. He said he should be excused for not filing return because a he was in prison, right? Notice that, and b he couldn't get access to documents because he was in prison, and those documents might have enabled him to claim deductions that would have helped him offset this pension. And because he couldn't prepare his complete return that way, he said, well, that, that, that's a legitimate reason for me to be able to, you know, wait until I get out of prison. He still isn't out of prison, as I understand today, according to Kate, at least when the court tried the case, he was still incarcerated and will be for a while. But, you know, he said he should be able to wait and do it then. Court wasn't so thrilled with this. A couple things the court noted about not liking his theory. First thing the court noted was he didn't even try to get an extension to file the return. You know, and the court does kind of point out that, yeah, people who are in the federal pen or state penitentiaries do actually manage to get tax returns filed. That has happened. It really does happen. Those people can file returns. So it's like it's nothing that that's impossible to file a return if you're in the pen. Number two, they said, this theoretical bit that I don't have access to the records I need to prepare my return, 
Well, the court said you couldn't tell us what type of records there were. You just told us there might be something that might be able to give you a deduction, but you couldn't even tell us what the type of deduction we might be able to get is. What's the nature of this theoretical deduction? Where do you have it? Why? It's like he's just positing that yeah, there, there's this, there might be these deductions if I got to look at this. The court said there's no evidence in the record about what type of deductions you might have. There's no evidence that those deductions, which would be mainly itemized deductions, could clear your standard deduction. And secondly, we ruled more than once that this isn't a valid reason to skip filing. So the court found that none of that represented reasonable cause, and they applied the late filing and late payment penalty to Mr. George in this case. We are getting to the end of tax season, right? Two weeks to go, right? And then it's done. So you have two weeks, and I know it's going to be a fun two weeks for many of us, but we'll get through that two weeks, and then we have CPE season begins, and I actually hit the road virtually instantly. I mean, as you know, I've got the 16th doing the rebroadcast. I'm doing sessions, and I'll actually be on the road being on the eastern part of the country through the end of October for various firm in firm projects for the most part. And then I'll start doing some actually real live sessions uh, right at the end of October in Idaho. And then I'll just keep moving. I'll be doing the Minnesota tax conference. I'll be doing a tax conference in Washington. I got lots of places we'll end up going. But now's the time to go sign up for your continuing education courses. They're available. They're coming up. Take a look at those. I'll be in, you know, like I said, a number of cities. You know, I should be here doing some stuff in New Jersey. Uh, before the end of this, we'll be doing some New Jersey courses in November. Like I said, the Minnesota Tax Conference this year I'll be at. We'll be doing courses in Idaho. I'll be doing some in Arizona. Right in the interim, I'll do one in Arizona on actually the 30th today, you know, which will be for the S Corps. And by the way, that one we hope will also be a Cal CPA rebroadcast. I'll let you know more about that once I'm sure we got it taped because we've got to kind of get that done. But we get everything taped, goes off, final let you know about that. So I've got Arizona courses, New Mexico courses. You know, we got courses going all over the place during the time frame for this year. So you can check in, see see where we're going, take a look at your courses, and I'll sign up. Oh, I should say, I also know I'm going to Michigan in the middle of all of this. So I'll be there in the Troy, Michigan area. So we've got those coming up. Check your calendar, sign up for the courses. I look forward to seeing you there. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for this week of September the 30th, 2019, almost October. You can catch our updates at CurrentFullTaxDevelopments.com. You can also send any questions or comments to me, Ed Zollers at CurrentFullTaxDevelopments.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter, my handle there is at Ed Zollers. I also follow discussions on Reddit. Uh, you go to slash r slash tax pros. I follow discussions on Cal CPA's tax talk site. That's open to any CPA or attorney. Anywhere in the country, go to groups.yahoo.com, search for Tax Talk, and you have to ask for permission to get in. But if you can tell, you know, if you tell Jim Counts, who is the moderator of the group, you give him information, you're a CPA from X, or you're an attorney from X, uh, then he'll let you in there. Lots of good discussions there about various tax topics. I also monitor and, you know, respond to posts on the Connect sites for state societies I'm a member of. That includes the Arizona Society, the Minnesota Society, and the New Jersey Society. So if you're a member of one of those groups, check your online sites and follow along there. Otherwise, wait till next week. We'll see what comes up. Next week, I should have some discussions on some regulations that came out late on Friday, or actually came out on Friday, getting into them now, related to individual coverage HRAs. So we'll have more information on that. We'll have some discussion next week, I expect, on deducting in, on deducting taxes uh, on investment real estate. And we'll talk about because we had discussion on that on Twitter. And we'll probably see a couple of other things that come up and discuss how those things impact next week. So I'm sure some other stuff will happen. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Otherwise, though, take care. Have fun with your last few clients that you're going to be working on th this year for this season. And we'll see you next week with more current federal tax developments.